Hello everyone, so this week we're focusing on women, the environment, and globalization. And what I hope to do with this lecture is to connect it to last week's lecture, which was on women and work, but talking about it both in regards to the environment and then talking about it in regards to globalization. So regardless of where you fit in the conversations around climate change or water politics here in the Central Valley or environmental pollution in general or the, just the state of the environment, I think we can all safely agree that we are all part of this planet, right? And that, you know, regardless or not of how, if we, we believe in certain arguments or where we fall in certain arguments, we are all responsible to one another since this is the only planet we have. And while there's been a lot of really important discussions around uh, environmental pollution, particularly here in the Central Valley, it's important to talk about, ironically, the human aspect of environment, of the environment. Because oftentimes when we talk about environmental issues like climate change or water politics, we sort of um, forget the human aspect of it, particularly how things like droughts, things like uh, higher temperatures, things like pollution in the air affect people. But not only people, but very much those who are the most marginalized in our communities. And that is really what we're going to unpack today is around how uh, issues around the environment particularly affect marginalized communities, especially communities of color, as well as women, as well as other marginalized communities. One of the framing questions we have is, can we talk about the environment as a social justice issue? Not just an environmental issue, but a social justice issue. And I think we could ask some questions here. Like, for example, when we think about who has access as well as a large amount of financial, economic, social control of our natural environments and resources, who is that? Is it the most marginalized or the most privileged? And privileged in what way? Privileged in regards to economics, you know, so those who are the most wealthy, to privilege in like what part of the world they live in, to privilege in regards to race, uh, to privilege in regards to gender. And when we start thinking about that and we start thinking about, okay, who actually either owns or controls or profits the most from our natural resources, we see it that it falls along some pretty gendered racial and class lines. Yet, when we talk about who grows the majority of our food, and I'm not just talking about the corporations that grow the food or the farmer, I'm more talking about the farmers or the people who actually work in the fields. So those who are actually picking the crops, planting the seeds, harvesting those, who grows that? Is it the most wealthy? Or is it sometimes the most marginalized who don't even get to see the benefits of that sort of, of the crop and the profits made from it? But to bring it to a closer or more intimate level, think about here in the Central Valley. How many of you directly or indirectly experience the consequences of air pollution? How many of you experience problems from unsafe drinking water? How many of you experience harmful effects of industrial farming and pesticides? Unfortunately, I think a lot of you do, or at least you know somebody who does. So a question that I want us to explore is how does access to things like clean air, clean water, safe agricultural working environments, access to fresh fruits and vegetables fall along gender, racial, and class lines? I think that it's really easy when we talk about climate change or when we talk about pollution to think about it as something that's a problem outside, right? We think of the polar ice caps and we think it is something that's like not affecting us directly. But obviously when we talk about environmental issues, they affect us all, particularly here in the Central Valley and in many parts of the world. And they particularly are devastating to marginalized communities, especially communities of color, low income communities, as well as women, which we're gonna talk about later. So. 
For example, I'm sure hopefully many of you have heard about the water crisis that happened in Flint, Michigan about a couple years back where essentially uh, due to budget costs and constraints, the state of Michigan forced the city of Flint, which is a predominantly African-American, Hispanic uh, city, very low income, has had a lot of uh, downward battles due to um, factories leaving and loss of jobs and so forth. Um, the city of uh, the state of Michigan forced the city of Flint to change its water supplies to a, what they thought would be a more cost-effective ways. Um, and in that changing, they had to then use very old pipes to bring in the water. These very old pipes had lots of lead in them, and for a good number of years, uh, this lead infiltrated the city. And even though community members came to show that, like, hey, my water is brown, my water is smelly. I don't feel good, I have these symptoms, symptoms of lead poisoning, my children have these symptoms of lead poisoning. It took an enormous amount of time and uh, and a real sort of resistance by the, by the state and city officials to recognize the crisis. And on one hand, lead in the water is something that is terrible in general and can happen sometimes in even more prosperous areas, you know, you get a bad pipeline, these things can happen. But the fact that it took so long in regards to dealing with the water crisis in Flint speaks to not speaks to the fact that it was happening so long in a community that was seen that essentially the state of Michigan didn't care about, mostly because it was predominantly black and brown. So when we talk about something like the Flint water crisis, we can talk about it more than just an environmental crisis. We can talk about racism and how racism, particularly racism against black and brown poor communities, led to this crisis where, you know, we have now a whole generation of children who are now going to have to live with the consequences of being lead poisoned at an early age. So learning difficulties, physical difficulties, and so forth for an over a generation. I grew up uh, in Saginaw, Michigan, which is a city that is right next to Flint, Michigan, uh, literally that's the city next to ours. So similar demographics and so forth. We have a chemical plant, Dow Chemical, which is a major chemical plant here in the United States, uh, producer of lots of chemicals, and they dump those chemicals into the Saginaw River, a main water source for us. And for years they were dumping things that are very cancerous, dioxins, and nothing was done about it. To the point now that um, if you go to any sort of riverfront park or anything around the riverfront, you will see these warning signs around the level of dioxins in the soil, which can cause cancer. And there's been very little repercussions for Dow Chemical Plant, very little effort by the state of Michigan to target this. And one has to think that maybe the reason why if it happened in more prosperous cities cities that had a bigger uh wage base and there might have been more sort of effort to not only clean up the riverbed but to also provide compensation for the communities that have been affected by it but since it was happening to a very low working class community these things get away with it so we can also talk about class or uh, discrimination against wage and wealth in regards to the environment. Of course, Fresno is not immune. And when we look at sort of just environmental health, we see incredible amounts of differences as well as racism, classism happening, where you have in some of the poorer areas of Fresno City, having the highest risk in regards to environmental pollution and so forth. So in regards to um, you know, uh, so those are the red areas so in regards to air pollution, water pollution, and soil pollution. Whereas the lighter spots that have a low risk, like Clovis and further north, have very little to minimum risk. And, you know, uh, we have issues in regards to lead poisoning here in Fresno, where some of the poorer communities are being exposed to lead. Fresno actually has a very high percentage of um, lead exposure and it's happening in lower income parts of the city. So it's not happening in the north of Fresno, it's happening in the southeast and the southwest of Fresno. 
and in the rural communities. So the thing is, is that we need to talk about the environment, not just in regards to protecting it, but talking about how it very much impacts marginalized communities, particularly communities of color, as well as low income communities, as well as, as we're going to talk about more, women. So at the heart of it, what we're talking about is environmental justice. So justice for our planet and justice for all people are two profound conversations that are happening oftentimes at the same time, but in different rooms, meaning that a lot of times when we talk about climate change or protecting of the rainforest and so forth, we are, we're talking about it as a separate issue from uh, violence against women, racial prejudice, uh, discrimination, marginalization of people with disabilities, uh, wage inequality and wealth inequality. Forgetting that not only is this happening on the same planet, the planet that we want to protect, but also that the environment and the conditions that people live in are hand in hand to together. And that we need to sort of talk about the interconnectedness of daily human life and the state of the earth often goes unexamined. But at this point in human history, we can't afford to separate these conversations. We can't think of it as the earth is somehow separate from us and thus exploitable or and then talk about at the same time that some people are just disposable. Some people, you know, deserve dirty water, right? A UN report on climate change stated that it is the poor and the most marginalized who suffer the most as the effects of climate change continue. And here's the reality. Over 300,000 people a year are already dying from the effects of climate change and another 4 billion are vulnerable to negative side effects. But it is mostly happening to those who are the most marginalized in society. They bear the brunt of environmental pollution, climate change, environmental destruction. They bear the brunt. So questions to think about, especially as you do the readings and you're watching the videos, the other ones attached to this week is around why should we talk about gender when we talk about pollution, global warming, or deforestation? Why should we talk about gender when we talk about environmental justice? And why should women be included in environmental protection? Women play a critical role in the managing of resources uh, in family and community levels across the world everywhere women play a very fundamental role in this and they are therefore also then the most affected by environmental degradation because here's the truth is that in communities around the world it is women who manage water sources for fuel and food as well as both for forest and our agricultural terrain women for the most part when you look around the world do the bulk of the farming they're the ones collecting the water they're the ones finding firewood, they're the ones gardening, they're the ones who are needing to work with the environment to find resources, particularly food, to feed their family. Women produce 60 to 80 percent of food in developing countries, uh, yet are often uh, refuse the ability to own or lease land and so forth. So here we have a situation where women by the, in the sort of division of labor, women are oftentimes more having to work with the environment in regards to just like daily tasks of like cleaning and cooking than men do. And therefore then oftentimes when you look at communities, women are the first to experience uh, effects to, to pollution, effects in regards to uh, deforestation, drought and so forth because they depend upon the environment in more ways than men. So ecofeminism developed in the 1980s in the context of the growing green movement and the feminist movement. It's about connecting women's rights and environmental rights. So instead of having two different conversations, connecting them together. And a lot of it is around, again, the principle of intersectionality, that, you know, these are tied oppressions, that deforestation, water pollution, um, 
the lack of, of, of uh, resources in regards to environmental protection go hand in hand in regards to, you know, discrimination against women, violence against women, uh, diseases and effects that happen to women. Since women have a large connection to the environment just from their daily cooking and cleaning lives, why are we talking about the environment as something that is separate when in fact it affects women in many intimate ways? So another thing that it does is that it, by connecting women's rights with environmental rights, it's about seeing a lot of parallels in regards to how we treat the environment and how we treat women, particularly around this sort of social hierarchy around gender equality and nature. I really like this quote by an ecofeminist named Gard who says, drawing on the insights of ecology, feminism, and socialism, ecofeminism's basic premise is that the ideology which authorizes oppression, such as those based on race, class, gender, sexuality, physical abilities, and species, is the same ideology which sanctions the oppression of nature. Ecofeminism calls for an end to all oppressions, arguing that no attempt to liberate women or any oppressed group will be successful without an equal attempt to liberate nature. Its theoretical base is a sense of self most commonly expressed by women and various other non-dominant groups, a self that is interconnected with all life. So if we wanted to sort of draw a chart around it, it's, it's around seeing these shared sites of oppression, seeing the systemic oppression of women and other marginalized groups, as well as the systemic oppression of non-human nature, and seeing those sort of intersecting oppressions in practice. So one way to think about this, and a lot of ecofeminists argue, is around, again, I, challenging the binaries. Whereas, you know, feminism have talked about challenging the gender binary, there's been discussions around challenging around the binary between humans and non-humans in the environment. Seeing us, instead of at the top of the food chain or better than everything, or that the environment is just for us to use as our will, seeing it as a connected web where we're all connected to each other. So very much, and then also not only challenging the hierarchy, but also challenging the patriarchy that supports that hierarchy in regards to man controls everything, all nature, all animals, and so forth. So it's not only about challenging binaries, but challenging the hierarchy of thinking around who controls land, sea, air, and animals. So an emphasis on collectivity, seeing us again as all of us living on this planet. We've only got one planet, therefore we are responsible to one another and emphasis on the plurality of voices. So it's not only about human voices, but also the rights of animals and plants, you know, and what their well-being and so forth. A big thing, though, about ecofeminism, um, and ecofeminism has had a lot of attacks against it, is this idea that women are essentially more connected by their nature than men. So I did make the argument before that women have a very intimate relationship with the environment. A lot of it is just because of the way that we've divided labor and, and resources. So is that women are often the ones who are doing the farming or the cooking and the cleaning. Therefore, you know, when there's pollution in the water, women oftentimes are the first ones to be exposed to it because they're the ones who are cleaning their babies, cleaning the house, drinking, and so forth. It's not to say that men don't also experience pollution, but women will usually experience it first just by the division of labor. That being said, you know, it's not that, you know, something that we challenged prior when we talked about the social construction of gender, it's not that women are more nature-y or that women are more in tune with nature than with men than with men. Like one, again, that's a very binary sort of thinking, and it's also not true. You know, men and everyone across the gender spectrum have can have relationships with nature in many ways. This very idea that, you know, women are just much more like, I guess, natural nature lovers and in tune with nature 
is again another construct of culture and it's been used to dismiss women's claim when they talk about environmental uh, abuses and, and degradation and then saying that you know and also women experience similar abuses then they sort of discount these women as being hippies or tree huggers or you know nature lovers in reality their arguments are valued on both sides around the fact that climate change is a real thing and pollution and water not good uh, violence against women a real thing you know discrimination against women a real thing and why not talk about them all, as seen as them all connected? I think, you know, a part of the sort of dismissing of ecofeminism is just in regard, it's, it's both, you know, a misogyny wrapped up in another package, as well as a real backlash around the idea that we are all connected and responsible to one another. So this is not about you know, it's not about an argument about whether you should eat meat or not, but more about that we are responsible to one another. We are responsible for the animals that we take care of as well as the animals that we live next to. The same thing for the plants and so forth. And I think a lot of it is misogynistic thinking. Like, think about this. Women are often referred to as animals or pieces of meat. What's the worst thing you can call a woman? A bitch, which is essentially referring to a female dog, right? What are some of the terms used to describe a parts of a woman's body? Right? Her rump, her breast, her legs, her rack, right? They become very, not only is it part of objectification, which is something that we've talked about before, but it's this interesting thing of degrading women as animals, seeing them like as literally as pieces of meat as well as animals in regards to being a bitch, having a pussy, which is also a reference to a cat. You know, I think that these things are interesting parallels that I think speaks to the larger nature of if we devalue animal rights, environmental rights, we also devalue women's rights. I see that there's some connections. Of course, you know, I think, and it's really important that when we talk about the environment, that there are real human consequences in this. Um, for example, uh, in regards to not only affecting women, but men, women, and everyone across the gender spectrum, where we have, um, for example, one of the most dangerous places to work is in the meat packing industry where you have you know workers making uh who have to who cut who are forced an assembly line to cut up pieces of meat a lot of times they hire they don't provide health insurance or livable hours and when workers try to defend themselves by forming unions and uh, employers use fear and intimidation to stop them Shockingly, the United States does very little, very little to um, uh, to address human rights abuses within the meat packing industry. Or, but at the same time, shockingly, the United States law does very little in regards to uh, animal abuses in the meat industry as well. And again, this is not about whether you should eat meat or not, but it is interesting that you know it's particularly low income, undocumented for marginalized individuals within the meat industry that experience incredible amounts of violence as well as persecution. And then at the same time, we have, you know, very terrible sometimes conditions for animals in these same meat industries. And if we want to talk about, you know, climate change, the meat industry is one of the top polluters contributing to global climate change. And if this trend could continue, well, will continue we can see something as you know as much as like a bigger impact on climate change as well as in human rights abuses something that you know Dolores covers a lot is around the farm workers rights movement but I think something that is not covered enough is that there's incredible amounts of violence particularly around female farm workers in the industry 
There's an estimated 3 million farm workers employed in the United States, and that number is probably higher, but it's hard, especially if any of the workers are undocumented. Uh, the National Agricultural Workers Survey, published by the Department of Labor, reported that 79% of the population is male, uh, the, and about 21% of the farm worker population is comprised of women. Though, I would say that that number is much probably higher, but there's just a lot of issues around documenting female workers in this industry. Uh, there's been a lot of reports around sexual violence and abuse happening within the fields, particularly directed towards female workers, as well as just outright discrimination in regards to female workers being able to get stable jobs within the industry. And if we wanted to explore, you know, the environmental impact that large-scale agriculture has in the Central Valley, we need to also talk about the human cost of that, particularly as it affects women and female farm workers. So all this is to say that, you know, and what I think ecofeminism gets to the heart of is that you can't talk about the environment without talking about gender and race and income and so forth, because those all play into a factor. Women experience the effect of climate change, environmental pollution, and so forth at higher rates than men, mostly because they're the ones who are having to work within the environment at a much more intimate daily level than men do. So it's important to have women's voices, particularly indigenous women's voices, at the forefront of politics and practices around environmental protection and climate change. You cannot make take long you cannot make long term and meaningful change to the environment without also breaking down power hierarchies that suppress and marginalize people, especially women. So throughout the years, there's been an incredible rise in regards to ecofeminism and the connection, particularly around women around the world, to address this issue and to sort of talk about women's rights and environmental rights in the same conversation. But there's still a lot that needs to go on with this because, again, environmental rights and women's rights doesn't happen in a bubble especially when we talk about it transnationally. We need to sort of talk about the effects that globalization has had in regards to not only women's right, not only in regards to the environment, but also in regards to women's rights on a multiple of scales, in regards to education and violence and so forth. So I wanna spend the next half of this lecture to talk about globalization and its impact on women. Before I get into Feminism, I do want to go over some key terms. I'm not going to assume that everybody knows what I mean when I talk about globalization. So often I like to talk about globalization as a big complicated word. I mean, it sounds kind of intimidating. However, it actually means something pretty simple, though we can complicate it more. It's used both in the positive as a way to connect people as well as used in the negative in regards to the growing, uh, growing and larger growing divide between very, very poor areas of the world and very, very rich areas of the world. A working definition for globalization essentially is around the economic, social, cultural, and, process, uh, and political processes of integration, meaning just greater connectivity, both economically, politically, socially, and so forth. We are more connected to one another than ever before. And a lot of that comes from uh, the expansion of transnational economic production, migration, communications, technologies, and so forth. So on the positive side, when we talk about globalization, and globalization is a neutral term because it can mean positive and negative and, and so forth. But on the positive aspect, you can talk about how we're greater connected than ever. I can, with on my phone, find out what the local news is in Tehran, right? Or other parts of the world or in the country. And with that, then, that greater connectivity means that we can exchange resources and ideas at a faster pace than ever. As well as, you know, in regards to that we are more mobile than ever. People are moving from places to different places more at a higher rate than ever. And with that then, that sort of exchanging of people and places 
is the idea of democracy and human rights being spread as well. So these are very positive aspects to globalization. There are, of course, negative aspects to globalization, particularly the fact that while, yes, we are in a much more connected time than ever, it doesn't mean that inequalities don't exist. And in fact, because of this connectivity, they've almost become further enhanced. So, for example, you have much more richer areas of the world, richer countries, like, for example, the United States, putting pressure on poorer, less developed countries in order to decrease their regulation, as well as to make sure that they can get the maximum profits. So that means then a lot of times uh, poorer countries or less, development, less developed countries are oftentimes put in this unequal relationship where their natural resources are used uh, primarily for rich companies based in richer countries, you know, so mining, forestry, and so forth happening in the global south, but as well as cheap labor, labor that has decreased regulation so they can pay their workers even far less than what they could be paid in the United States or places that are um, uh, have these sort of work uh, labor rights laws. But while these countries or these areas around the world that have that are being exploited this way, it doesn't necessarily mean that they then get the benefits of the products that are produced or the labor that is being used for it. So there is an unequal distribution of resources and flow of goods where you have more richer parts of the world using the labor and the resources of poorer parts, but then the benefits of that don't necessarily come back to the poorer parts of the, of the world. And what this does is also reduce uh, state sovereignty for particularly uh, marginalized areas around the world, poor countries, less developed countries. It also creates greater income inequality. So it's very um, interesting to see that while we live in a world that is connected more than ever, we have probably we have the strong we have the highest sort of gap between very very rich parts of the world and very very poor, as well as just a just a greater income inequality globally speaking. To further elaborate this, I just wanted to show you this, and this comes from the World Health Organization, just to sort of show you, because I think sometimes it, this, the division between uh, poorer countries, richer countries, or the global north and the global south can, see, can feel a little bit abstract, since especially here in the United States, we have areas around the country, areas within our local communities that are very, very poor, and people living in very, very poor conditions. But if we wanted to talk about the inequality globally, I think this is a good sort of example where when you look at sort of countries in the global north, that includes the United States, parts of Europe, and so forth, access to improved sanitation, toilets, right, clean water. In the, in the global north, it's about 100%, though, of course, that's not always accurate for many parts of the global north. On average, 100% of the population has access to sanitation, whereas in the Global South, about half of that. Paved roads, something that probably many of you uh, take for granted. I know that I do, and then get really angry about potholes or road construction. Paved roads mean a big deal because they allow, well, they allow vehicles to drive on them. And that means like school buses and ambulances and buses to take you to other places to work. In the Global North, around 87%, whereas in the Global South, 24%, which means that it's a limited access for those people in the Global South to get to a hospital, to get to a school, to get to a place that you can earn a decent wage. Computers, personal computers, around 68 for every 100 people in the Global North, 5 in the Global South. Internet users, around 69, 15 in the Global South. And population covered by cellular services, 99% here in the Global North, around 76%. And then daily newspapers, which I know you might have strong feelings about the news today, but being able to know what's happening in your country or what's happening even in your town is an important service for you to be connected and to be informed. In the Global North, there's about 261 on average for 1,000 people 
whereas in the global south that number is not even reduced by half is less than half 59 as well as when we just think about power consumption you know where you have over 9,000 in the global north versus less than 2,000 in the global south so Globalization is both good and bad, but women are particularly affected by it, particularly poor women in poor countries to a much worse extent. So taking one issue, for example, uh, in regards to the, the consequences of this economic, this global economic divide between the very, very rich parts of the world versus the very poor. And one is to look at girls' education. So two-thirds of all countries have reached gender parity in primary enrollment, meaning primary enrollment meaning gra uh, grade school, means that about two-thirds of the world have boys and girls going to school at the same number. But second enrollment, meaning from middle school to high school, is a much harder challenge. 62 million girls between the ages of 6 and 15 are not in school around the world. 16 million girls between the ages of 6 and 11 will never enter school compared to 8 million boys. South and West Asia, 80% of out-of-school girls will never start compared to 16% of out-of-school boys. And when we look at just sort of the global numbers around uh, education, particularly the limited access to education for girls and women, we see that 54 of the 76 million illiterate young women live in only six, nine countries. India, Pakistan, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Bangladesh, Democratic Republic of Congo, United Republic of Tanzania, Egypt, and Burkina Faso. Now, of course, in these countries, uh, getting education to boys is also an issue. And But when we see the numbers, we can see that women and girls have faced much harder challenges in regards to getting access to education. This is a statistic that um, I've shared before, but um, when we talk about just gen uh, workplace inequality globally, we see similar patterns in regards to women. Uh, working age population in the workforce, uh, and these are people working in jobs getting a wage. Uh, globally, 76.1% of men versus less than half 49.6%. Advancing gender equality could enable women, millions of women and girls to pursue their dreams, work, and be financially independent, adding to about $12 trillion to the global economy by 2025. But uh, right now we have six countries, Belgium, Denmark, France, Latvia, and Luxembourg, and Sweden, who give men and women equal rights when it comes to work. But in at least 180 other countries, this is far from the case. Now, here's something that I shared before in the work module. Women make up the majority of the workforce, but are represented in less than half of the paid workforce. So that means then women are working. They've always worked. A lot of times working in places that they don't get a wage, though they are supporting their families in this. So advancing gender equality in regards to paid work, wage labor, can also work to assist women and able to pursue other parts of their lives and careers, and would also add, as I said before, over $12 trillion to the global economy by 2025. Talking about these numbers then, when we look at women in work globally, we see a couple of factors into this, right? One is low wages. Across the world, women are uh, the lowest paid work. Even though they make up the majority of the workforce, they do they are not often in working in paid jobs, like a wage job. Globally, they earn 24% less than men, and at the current rate of progress, it will take about 170 years to close this gap. 700 million fewer women than men are in paid work. And you wonder then, like, well, why is it that why aren't women getting uh, jobs that pay them? Why are they all in this informal economy? Well, one, it's of access, right? There's a lot, there's a lack of decent work for women. 75% of women in developing regions are in the informal economy, meaning not the formal where they get a wage, where they are less likely to have employment contracts, legal rights, or social protection, and are often not paid enough to escape poverty. 
600 million are in the most insecure and most precarious forms of work. And a lot of it has to do to discrimination that women aren't offered these jobs or offered to get education to get these jobs. So they have to go through the informal economy, which means that they are paid less and exploited more. There's also this other factor, as we've talked about in the work module, around unpaid care work. Women do at least twice as much as paid unpaid care work, such as child care and housework, than men, globally speaking, when we look at the numbers. Sometimes 10 times as much, often on top of their paid work. The global value of this work each year is estimated at around $10 trillion. So $10 trillion of work not being actually financially compensated, which is equivalent to one-eighth of the world's entire GDP. We talked about this before, um, and this is one other sort of global issue. There are many other global issues that we could talk about in regards to women. But the other one that we've touched upon before is around violence against women. An estimated 35% of women globally have experienced some form of physical and or sexual violence. Or another way to look at it is, is one in three. And as many as 38% of murders of women are committed by an intimate partner. There is a global academic epidemic around violence against women and a lot of it has to do to the pressures uh, when we think about it globally around the sort of financial political and social constraints happening in that area particularly when we talk about the global south where if you have already income disparity uh, ecological devastation political uprising or instability women those who are the most marginalized in the communities are going to suffer the m more from it and experience much more higher rates of violence and so forth. And these numbers, you know, are there in regards to the violent epidemic that's happening against women, where 35% of women worldwide have experienced either physical and or sexual intimate partner violence or non-partner sexual violence globally when we look at these numbers. 7% 7, 7 of women have been sexually assaulted by someone other than a partner. And this, of course, is most definitely underreported. Globally, as, we, as much as 38% of murders of women are committed by an intimate partner. And about 200 million women have experienced female genital mutilation or cutting. Okay, so that was just a brief shot of globally speaking, when we talk about women's rights and what's the status of women. And it's not good. It's not. It is getting better, but it's definitely not good. But how do we, we in this feminist class, we in general, our position in society, address these inequalities in a way that is both, of course, beneficial, but also empowering to the very people that these issues are affecting? How do we work across borders, across lines, across social economic differences to work with each other in a very much more respectful, ethical manner in order to change the world, promote our rights, and create a better future for women and girls? Well, one thing to do is we have to be sure that we're critical in regards to feminism. Uh, you know, we've talked about the F word at the beginning of this class, and we've talked about how, you know, at the core of it, feminism is about equality. There's also something to say that, you know, when we talk about feminism, that we should talk about it in the plural. Feminist and feminism doesn't just start in North America or Western Europe. It's not a U.S. thing. Feminism has been around in many cultures and communities around the world. They might not have used feminism but the idea of equality, women having equal rights to be involved in the affairs of their community and women holding positions of leadership was and are present in many cultures around the world. So we don't really have claim to say that like, we are the only ones who know about women's rights, whereas in many cultures and communities around the world, they as well have this. For example, Native American and First Nations communities just here in the United States, as well as indigenous tribes in Africa and throughout South Asia, have argued, uh, have always had feminism or feminist sort of principles, and have argued that, in fact, it was colonization by Western Europe and North America that forced women from their positions of leadership to subservient roles. 
So at the heart of it, feminism is not a new concept in many parts of the world, but it has been taken up differently in many communities around the world. So it's important for us to be critical when we say like this is the way that we should do it in regards to women's rights or women's equality, and instead work with people from different communities, different backgrounds, different histories, in order to listen to them and understand, well, what does gender equality mean for them and what do they need to achieve their goals? At the heart, that's what transnational feminism is about. It's about connecting and organizing around gender equality, which we know that there is incredible amounts of issues happening, you know, just the numbers alone that I shared with you around education, around uh, work inequality, around violence, and those are just three out of many. Um, but connecting and organizing around these issues with women across the globe and being critical then of globalization and its continued exploitation of particularly third world or global south countries, being critical of western-based ideology that dominates and silences women outside of the U.S. and other in the western world, not speaking over, not about trying to save women in the global south, but speaking next or speaking besides and advocating for with them and letting them have a platform to speak to their issues. So at the heart of it, feminism is complicated and complex it is. It is also very fluid and reflects the culture and historical circumstances of the people around it. Globalization have has of course connected feminist writers and activists together in ways that have never been possible before. But a question that always as you go forward in this work, particularly when we talk about gender equality on a global scale, is how do we work together around the world to promote gender equality and stop gender violence that does not silence the concerns or important issues that many communities face? How do we work together? How do we embolden one another? How do we support one another across many differences? Okay, see you in the next one.